Cool. Well, first and foremost, uh, really excited for the discussion today. Phenomenal panel for webinar number three of the Building an Enterprise Level System with Zero Series presented by CFO Techstack, as you can see on screen there. My name is Jack Teal. I'm the APAC Commercial Lead at Mayday, uh, and we're on a mission to mend month end for larger zero businesses, beginning with the needs of those who are multi-entity. So very uh, relevant for our uh, topic today. As a little background, I started my career as an accountant with PwC about 10 years ago. I completed my charter there and then went on to work as an advisor to SMBs, SMEs, uh, and I've spent the last five years working in a variety of different startup roles across the zero accounting tech ecosystem. I'm really passionate and as bullish as ever about the strength of the zero platform. And it's great to be seeing so many larger businesses succeeding on it, especially after that so many started as small businesses 10, 15 years ago when Zero is just a startup and are now dealing with the challenges of being multi-entity businesses. It's awesome to see. Something that is quite clear though, having been around the ecosystem for a while, is the lack of relevant content for the audience. The, the audience of finance professionals in that upper echelon, that larger Zero business, which is why I'm so thrilled to be here uh, on this session, but also as part of this whole series, diving deeper into this space and hopefully adding a lot of value with awesome panelists like the ones we've got here today. With that being said, I might take the opportunity to give them a chance to introduce themselves before going any further. So I might hand over first to you, Michael, um, and then we'll go from there. Hi guys, thanks for joining us. My name is Michael Flynn. I'm uh, based in New Zealand's southernmost city in Vicargill. Uh, I've been an accountant uh, for almost 20 years and have worked in both the public and um, private enterprise SME and larger space based in Melbourne, Sydney, the UK and now New Zealand. Um, I have, uh, you know, I've quite enjoyed this space having worked in the zero and zero ecosystem for the last five years. Um, now with, with Findex, a professional services firm located in Australia and New Zealand. Um, and I'm passionate about um, the strategic advisory and, and virtual CFO style services and, and digital solutions. Um, you know, my aim is to make sure that our clients and those that we work with get the best out of, out of zero um, or the solutions that they choose to use and, uh, and, and have the best experience with, with who we work with. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Uh, William, I'll hand to you next. Hey, everyone there. Thanks again for joining. Well, that's a bit of a tough one to follow, but uh, as Jack mentioned, my name's William Bracewell and I'm a director and founder at Wellwoods based in, in Melbourne. Uh, myself, I've been an outsourced CFO for a number of years now, currently managing as an outsourced CFO between 80 to 100 million of annual revenue. Uh, I think it's about 150 staff um, across six clients and about 16 entities in total. So particularly interested in finding efficiencies for our sort of finance teams and the operations and how we can integrate Zero with its ecosystem to empower the staff to um, focus on, on growth initiatives and further in the business. So really excited to share the insights we've learned to date and learn from the fellow panelists today. Thanks. Great, thanks William and appreciate you being here. David, over to you. Amazing, thanks Jack. Hi everyone, my name's David Tucker, I'm the, the co-founder and CEO here at, at Mayday. Uh, so I'm I'm an accountant by, by training, did my first five years of my career in practice, uh, then was twice the, the, the finance leader and CFO of a, of a multi-entity, uh, zero using business. I've been an accounting tech entrepreneur for the last decade now, as previously the founder of Chaser, the, uh, the accounts receivable app, and then for the last yeah, three years now have been building Mayday with my co-founder Griff and our, our growing uh, fantastic team. Um, so yeah, brilliant to be um, be here today. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, David. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, William. Uh, as you can tell, awesome panel for the topic of discussion. Very relevant. Lots of experience here. So hopefully a few gold nuggets for everyone to take home. In, in terms of the discussion and before I crack into the actual agenda and start asking questions, I do just want to set the scene a tad more. So as mentioned by David, by myself, uh, you know, at Mayday, we're currently built for larger zero businesses. And so we're having conversations with the finance teams of those businesses. And we're often hearing that they're looking looking for an answer to two key questions. One is, is zero still the right system for me? And two, how long will that remain the case? 
So we want to help answer those questions in this series um, because we know that the ERP move is quote unquote horrible and hectic. As one of our own clients said, it's incredibly expensive as I'm sure we'll get into in today's conversation. Uh, and that's before 58% of ERP implementations fail and then people come back to zero anyway. So that's why we want to coin the term or why we have coined the term ER peace of mind, the peace of mind of knowing that you can scale on zero into your growth phase without needing to make that painful move to an ERP. Um, so yeah, it's designed to be helpful to our target customer. It's not this whole series, today's session, it's not product marketing, uh, it's not product demos. And although this is the one session that you'll see me in a Mayday t-shirt and obviously David's in one too, no other session we will be because we're not representing Mayday in any other session. We're just having a conversation that's hopefully as valuable as possible about writing the misconception that you can't scale with zero into your growth because you can, but we don't want to overcorrect either. We know that zero is not for every single business in every single scenario. Um, so we want to make sure that we cover up on where an ERP does make sense and where you might reach that level of size or complexity. Uh, that means it is the right move for you. So that's the last and final piece of context from my side. This is the agenda for today. We're going to delve first and foremost into what Zero does really well for multi-entity businesses. What are the key challenges that you'll then begin to experience as you grow up on Zero as a multi-entity business? We'll then discuss how you can leverage the Zero ecosystem to reduce those pains or solve those challenges. And then we'll discuss when an ERP might be the right solution for you. We'll then try and share some tips uh, and go over any remaining questions in the Q&A as well. So feel free to make the most of that. So to kick off, Will, I'm going to throw to you first. Um, for this question, you know, for businesses that have grown up to become multi-entity, what does Zero do well for those businesses? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, Zero has been amazing at doing the 80-20 rule. It's focused on what it does what it does well, which is accounting, um, bank reconciliations, general ledgers, child balance, and so on, but hasn't focused so much on the add-ons, which I think is a part of their thesis that they yeah, do the 80-20 and then they let people add on the items where they see need. So what Zero does really well, I mean, for a multi-entity, not a whole lot bar sort of managing each uh, into each entity itself. I mean, you can set up a zero file in all of 30 seconds, which is which is pretty positive. Uh, most accountants of at least in Australia, I think they have a, the lion's share of of the people's skill set. So it's well known um, well known software. So when staff do come on board, they they know it pretty well. Uh, but beyond that, I mean, it is is pretty limited in, in helping the multi-entity month end. I mean, if you don't have any other systems, you'll be surely using a lot of Excel to to do loan matrices and whatnot to, to plug the gap. And, and so, yeah, what are those key kind of pain points or challenges that, you know, if, if we've started on zero, we've become a multi-entity business now, what are those initial pains and challenges that you see people start to experience? A lot of it, as I'm sure everyone on this call knows, is around loans, uh, intercompany transactions, one one company buying uh, or paying a bill for another company, um, reconciling that at month's end, it's it's pretty difficult. And um, using Excel, loan matrixes, uh, trying through trial balances and whatnot to identify that transaction takes a, a lot of time and, and takes the speed and agility out of the finance team pretty, pretty quickly. And and I mean, Michael, based on what Will said there, do you have anything to add in terms of your own experience with clients who are who have maybe started as a as a small single entity, grown up to be a multi entity, and then how they've dealt with those challenges on on the platform? Well, I guess you know, just as Will as William has said, um, when they are smaller. They do everything really well. They're, they're used to running one zero file. Um, zero does work well. Uh, AP, AR, bank recs, um, automated reminders are, are great for debtors and the rest. Um, but as soon as they have you know, more than one entity, they begin to forget to do those things which, which work around you know, multiple entities. So the, the intercompany loan reconciliations, they often fall out of balance because they forget that they've got to enter things in double-sided, which is, I guess, one of the, one of the pain points. Um, you know, 
as soon as someone starts buying more businesses, potentially there's multiple finance depart, uh, departments. So there's a lack of communication. Uh, and, and that's when zero as a standalone entity, uh, sorry, standalone system doesn't actually work as well as, as, as what it might. Or um, that's where, you know, talking about ERPs, that's where ERPs do better because they won't let you or, 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 they, or they have controls in place to stop things falling out of balance a lot of the time. Um, and that's where you, we often see the, the growing pains. To that, to that point, I mean, David, it'd be good to get your, your perspective on this. If, if people are starting to experience challenges from intercompany loan side, doing intercompany transactions, running into those headaches, is that where some of this misconception is coming from around, ah, oh, it's time to go to an ERP too early? because I've got three entities and my zero files aren't talking to each other. Whereas maybe that's, I'd be keen to get your perspective on, you know, whether or not that's leading to some of that confusion around when is it time to go to an ERP? Is it necessary just because I'm struggling with some intercompany transactions? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a really interesting point. And, you know, back to that, the, the growing page side of things and, and how that relates to it is the sort of the idea that the horse is starting to bolt, right? Like whether it be, intercompany balance sheet recs have you know have fallen out of balance and you haven't had time to get a handle on them and month after month has built up and then you've got a kind of year's worth of transactions that you're then needing to re-reconcile it's the you know it's the recharges between your entities that you aspire to do monthly but got crowded out a particular month and then they got crowded out the next month and you've just not been able to get into a monthly rhythm of, of running those. And absolutely, I think there, there has been and still is in large part, and, and that's very much, as you say, the, the purpose of, of this series and what we do with CFO Tech Stack, that misconception that if like multi-entity, then I've got these kind of grown-up pain points, I'm concluding that I'm potentially I'm concluding and wrongly so that I'm in that I'm in the wrong place um, because, you know, Xero is incredible at what it does, but its core focus is kind of accountants and bookkeepers to the smaller end of, of SME and, and everything on their sort of website material reflects that. At the same time, you know, you see amazing businesses grow up to, you know, kind of scale of tens, fifties, hundreds of entities on zero building um, their stack around it. But I think it is that pain point or historically has been that pain point of, well, multi-entity feels like a stage I cross that grass can look sort of greener on the ERP side of things. And people, people fall into that sort of tractor beam of, well, maybe I'm in the wrong place here. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, uh, to that point, we, I just want to throw to you, what do you see the difference? Like David's kind of alluded to it, Michael's alluded to it. You know, we, we get to these pain points and we start to question, can I, can I go further on zero? In your experience, what, what do you see as the difference between a business that's saying, hey, I've got a few pain points on zero, it's time to move versus, you know, how, how do we get to a situation where you've got that, but you've also got 50 entity, 70 entity businesses that are using it successfully? What's the, what's the gap between those two? Uh, probably time and uh, the team's ability to um, know when they're sort of out of their league and, and reach out to businesses to help sort of structure this. So yeah, yeah as we were discussing, uh, have had a few a few companies that have reached out to us um, that were going through similar transitions where they were discussing should we or should we not go and were able to steer them away from the ERP system. Um, not so there's anything against it. There is definitely a time and a place for an ERP system, but people just sort of think, oh, I'm at this size, so it's time to go, but they don't actually know what Zero can offer um, and the ecosystem that it can offer. So yeah, approaching uh, professionals that do have that ability to leverage from other clients and, and go to them and to, to give you advice is, is pretty important. I mean, there's a big part of it, just the awareness of the ecosystem that you're kind of alluding to. People yeah. aware. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. I mean, uh, yeah, a lot of people that, even with Mayday, I've, I've give, rolled it out to a few of um, some friends and clients and, and whatnot and didn't even know they was aware of it. So, um, again, that's definitely a, an awareness piece that if you're not in it day to day, um, looking at this stuff, trying to consistently improve the finance function and operations, then 
yeah, it's it's sometimes pretty difficult to to find. Yeah, and Michael, I'm keen to get your thoughts on the ecosystem as well. I mean, we're we're moving through this list probably quite quickly, but I think it's all into it's interrelated. As soon as you start to talk about the the growing pains on the zero, you start to talk about the ecosystem. It's very much hand in hand. So, how how do you see this play out within your client base? You know, once they start to to run into challenges, what's that next step? How do they solve them? Well, well, you know, William's exactly right. So often people look at it and say, well, zero is an accounting system. And they don't think outside that, you know. Um, uh, often they come and talk to us after they've begun the move to an ERP, um, uh, just simply on the basis that, you know, they've, they've thought, oh, we need to do more than what zero can handle. So they need a workflow management solution or they need, you know, a subscription service with revenue recognition or they need a bigger fixed asset register and they need different, you know, tax and normal uh, and accounting depreciation. And they, they simply forget to talk to, well, not forget, but they, they don't mention that they're talking to someone around, um, around an ERP to their, to their advisor or their advisor might not be you know, as, um, as knowledgeable on the zero ecosystem as, as others might be. Um, and it's, uh, it is what it is. And what happens is they move or they start making the move and they spend a lot um, on the move when, when a, a chat with uh, you know, someone on a digital team could have could have saved the money. Great examples include, you know, clients that have moved to um, uh, what I would call legacy systems now, legacy ERPs, um, uh, when Zero wasn't around and the ecosystem didn't exist, and they've gone from legacy system to new ERP. And even that move itself, when I look at it and say, you could have moved back to Zero with a ecosystem solution in place that does workflow um, uh, in terms of project management and billing and, 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 um, and really good profitability reporting out of zero made your life so much easier. Um, but because you've, you are ERP and you think that you, you are big enough and you are big enough to be ERP, but you don't realize that there is space within that that zero environment. Um, and I really think that's, that's the key is once you've got the knowledge and once you can approach um, advisors to talk about it, there is that ability to you know, continue using zero. Um, uh, limitations of zero and the big one is transaction limits. So often um, people move potentially because they're hitting the transaction limits on zero when they could go to the ecosystem and, and look at um, uh, you know, tools that summarize their data to make it easier for them to manage. You know, there are ways around it. Um, again, one of the big things we've seen and why some people move is simply due to tracking. You know, zero can handle two tracking categories. Someone is a part of a, a larger group and they need more than two tracking categories and they can't figure out a way it, and they move. And you know, so their limitations are zero, but moving to an ERP, I don't think is the only choice. No, some really good points. And and the session we had yesterday, which was optimizing zero for scale, we we were joined by Regan Ashworth, who is in the API development side of zero and spoke to the limits. And um, it's really interesting. So if you are aware of the limits or concerned of the limits, that's definitely one to check out because uh, it's a good point. But th there's, as to Michael's point, you know, you, there are there are ways to circumvent those limits and to work around them. Uh, and even within the zero ecosystem, not all add-ins or integrations are made equal. Some handle that that data interaction a lot better than others. I mean, from a coming full circle, we're, we're talking ecosystem now. We're talking about zero add-ons uh, to bring it kind of within the multi-entity multi-entity topic of today. David, I'm keen to get your thoughts around what seems to be a new category evolving. Um, we're obviously quite close to it, but this this idea of intercompany multi-entity and where you draw that line with consolidation. What are they the same thing or are they are they different? How do you see it? Yeah, amazing. And so where I see our space with Mayday is like to talk about all the work between accurate bookkeeping and accurate accounting that, that you need as part of month end. So, you know, accurate bookkeeping would be your bank fees, your bank rules in zero, your whatever OCR technology, be that Dext or Hubdoc of that ilk, 
that you're using to get accurate third party uh, transaction information into your um, into your general ledger into zero. Then the other end of the spectrum, we've got our suite of reporting and consolidation tools that we're going to use in all ledgers as part of month end for reporting purposes. And that's where our consolidation tool, you know, something like a, um, you know, a Calxa, a, a join um, would, um, would, would sit. We are everything in between. How can we how can we truncate that process as close to, to real time accounting as possible? All of the adjustments we need to take and make to uh, our bookkeeping information, you know, reconciling our, our intercompany balances, recharging those costs and revenues between our entities, uh, between different departments within the same entity. Um, and yeah, getting that closest that process as close as possible to, to real time. And that's that's a space we're really excited to, to play. So I think it's a really, yeah, it's a really important point because what we're doing there is we're complementing whatever reporting and consolidation tool that you're um that you're using. And ultimately we are replacing the spreadsheet-based process of manual identification, calculation, and posting each month that a lot of businesses have carried out each month taking them a lot of, of manual time but then in other cases businesses haven't had the time to, to carry out as part of month end and they've then built up to year end debt that needs to get cleared as part of closing off the year end accounts and now they are having the ability to carry out monthly and and i think to that general trend it zero has been around for a long time now uh there's a lot of businesses that have had that time to grow up and are, are dealing with these challenges the volume of those businesses is is now large enough that it's almost you know as with more you then end up with new categories that are being defined so i mean to throw it back to michael and william maybe william i'll go to you first when we start talking specifics around apps and tools because i know a lot of people listening are saying well i'm a multi-entity business on zero uh, I'm keen to understand what add-ons because there's a thousand apps on the ecosystem that I can connect. So you guys, you know, William first, what, what are those tools, Mayday or others, that you're saying, look, if we're talking about a multi-entity group on zero, we're talking about trying to optimize their processes and systems, we're talking about month end potentially, what are the go-to tools that you're working with uh, the majority of your businesses on? Yeah, um, you guys did summarise my tech stack quite nicely in your post on CFO tech stack. I think it was last week, but I guess before we did dive into that, just do want to flag yeah. to everyone that a lot of time people just add apps for the sake of adding apps. So for a client recently, they had four different payment mode wise, they had transfer wise, they had um, Air Wallets, and they had another one, and it's just because one time they were trying to pay, pay an international entity it didn't accept wise so then they went to this other one so um definitely take your time before rolling these things out because there's nothing more annoying to your finance team than having to log into 10 15 different apps um, to do one task and then go straight back where that task could potentially have been uh, done in one of the other entities um, so i mean rule of thumb that i go for is five to six add-ons is usually the max you want to be at. And if you break a business down into its components, that five or six, I mean, we have OCR, which David did mention. So my preference is Dext, um, just purely because of its integration with other apps. And there is HubDoc, which is free, but for a relatively immaterial amount, um, Dex I do find is, is better. Um, and again, back to the same thing, I had a client that had Dex and a HubDoc running at the same time, which, was causing all sorts of um, issues. <clears throat> uh, delegation of authority. So uh, one that I haven't seen a lot of clients use, but I think it's amazing uh, plug on to zero because it does have very, very lacking controls is approval max. So that's a delegation of authority software where if a bill gets sent into it, um, it will then go through an approval workflow and then get sent to zero. So it goes dext, sends to zero once it's, uh, to approval max, sorry, once it's been processed and then approval max will then get approved based on various criteria whether that's supplier account code location tracking category um, quantum value and then it will go through all these people um, and then finally get sent to zero for payment uh payroll i mean if you're just a seller in wages payroll there's no reason to not use zero it's does the the basics pretty well 
when you do go down the award path, then things such as I, I like to use Employment Hero, but that's broadly because I've just used Employment Hero the most. But there's various other ones out there that, and there's various bespoke offerings. I know, for example, with um, aged care and sort of uh, assistance with childcare, there is some very, very good payroll softwares that have been built for that service line. So, would look to that. Um, Zero obviously is my preference. I just find it's they're the most um, evolving, the quickest, and and have grown the best. Um, and then. Uh, some sort of reporting software. So, have used Sift, Fathom, um, Spotlight. They're they're all much for muchness. It's really just what your team's used to and, and what you're used to. Um, and then for payroll payment software, sorry, uh, Stripe is the easiest integrated. But there is some better ones out there that I've seen, such as Pinch Payments. Um, is a bit of probably a smaller one, but you can build a um, you can do direct debits and you can build a, a pretty pretty um bespoke arrangement with the pinch payments team so yeah no cool I, i'm wary of time but michael did you have one or two from your side that you'd you'd add or or see used quite regularly amongst your multi-entity clients yep i I will just do a shout out for new zealand um, and zero payroll we often um if you've if you've got uh staff that um have uh, changing pay pay schedules. Um, we find New Zealand zero payroll often um, doesn't calculate the leave accurately. Um, so we, we often recommend other other um, providers. So um, he, he's stolen my thunder really. So, you know, Dex prepare um, uh, to approval max, great solution. Um, zero as a base. And then, you know, I deal a lot with trades, trades based um, uh, providers. So, uh, we're looking at a number of different solutions that go from everything from, you know, um, really basic using zero, um, zero uh, projects right up to you can do multi-entity out of, uh, out of Arrowflow. You've got WorkGuru. That's great. You've got, you know, a bunch of others as well. Um, right through to a lot of the time we use spotlight reporting, which is, which is quite good for um, both single entity, multi-entity um, consolidation uh, reporting. It can be a bit fiddly at times, but um, you know, if you've got some good controls around, um, around your, your, your inter-entity accounts, um, then, then it doesn't get too messy. Um, but I, you know, the range and scope of what you can do in the ecosystem is, is pretty, pretty mm -hmm. good. Um, without having to then jump up. So I guess it comes down to, you know, when we when we push for software, and I'll just quickly make note that it isn't one size fits all. Um, the best thing is approaching it as a very, um, very broad, well, what can I do and what needs automated as opposed to automate everything? It's it's what wins am I going to get the most efficiency and, and target those. You know, if something takes you, 10, 20 minutes a month and you want to automate it, well, do you, it's only 10, 20 minutes. Um, is it going to, what's the cost benefit of, of that kind of stuff? And, and that's where you have to have people going a bit overboard as Will William said in, in the, in adding apps for app sake, so to speak. So, um, so yeah, I'll, I'll leave that there. Awesome. Cool. It's probably a nice, a nice place to shift gears and, and move to the final point or point four on the agenda here around when might an ERP be the only solution? We've spoken about zero, what it does well. We've spoken about the growing pains. We've spoken about the power of the ecosystem. But where do we draw that line? I mean, David, can can you share any from your perspective, the the people you've worked with, your own experience in as you know leading a finance team? When might an ERP be the only solution if you're a multi entity business? Say, so, you know, a lot. A lot less often than than people think today is you know is is the preface to that answer you know as evidence like we've got you know Kathy and her six entity group are moving back to zero from NetSuite right now Parish and um, you know his fifth entity group uh, you know moved over at the end of last year from um, from Sage Intact because saw that you know it wasn't just a cost saving it was seeing that you know with zero plus made a plus the ecosystem they were able to achieve a superior level of, of system and and automation um so look, i think 
I think the things that, that that it really kind of boils down to are, you know, sometimes the the transaction limits do bite um, the the tracking category, you know, and there's there's not a solution involving the you know ecosystem and, and aggregating the posting information, which which Michael touched on earlier. Like that's always the go to, and a bunch of time that can address. Um, you know, transaction limits is an issue, but you know, sometimes, um, sometimes there is that issue, and you know, sometimes it's local local tax requirements um, as well, due to the the territories that um, that people operate in. Um, so, like, there are absolutely those those times. I think the the experience that I take and have seen from others is always make sure there is a very specific reason that zero plus its ecosystem can't scale for you and only once you have bottomed that out is it potentially the start the the right time to start thinking about erp because very 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 often you will be able to find that your issues can be addressed it's just that i think people sometimes sort of fall into that tractor beam of well don't you know which like netsuite given their price point can invest in a huge like sales organization who will do a very good job of convincing you why a business like you needs to be um, on an ERP like them um, right now, but always making sure that there is that kind of very specific thing you can hang your hat on to say this, this is the thing that zero plus its ecosystem can't do. Yeah. I think that point around not just being a cost saving or a time saving, but actually could your system be better off? Uh, I know I've heard this, from a few other people as well that I've spoken to around actually the team love it moving back it's the ease of use the the, the ability to automate x y and z so yeah no very good point i mean will i might actually get your perspective first and then and then michael to to finish up and then we can jump into kind of some takeaways and any q and a what I, I what experience have you had with that erp zero crossover any particular clients that come to mind that you can kind of speak to that specific experience where they've gone through and said, I think it's time to go ERP. What did that look like? Did they end up ERP? Did they stay zero? Can you talk us through that? Yeah, so a lot of the time that the clients have come to us and saying that they need to go to the ERP systems is, it's a lot to, due, due to controls. So zero obviously has very, very bad controls in terms of Anyone that has a level of access can do manual journals, can post things, can approve things, can pay things. So, in a in a set up um, ERP system, they do have sort of delegation of duties, which I think is a, a massive drawback of zero. So, if anyone on zero is listening on here, please prioritize that as a as a uh, upgrade to your software because yeah, it's, it's pretty basic functionality that you should be able to set up. Um, a, a segregation of duties. So if someone posts a journal, they can't approve the journal. Uh, but that does come back to why people do love or enjoy using Xero is because of what you just spoke to about Jack and David on um, the simplicity and the ease of use. So it's really weighing up the, the pros and cons of being able to move quickly um, and and transact quickly and the the lack of controls um, and the ability for fraud. So, yeah, I mean, some of our clients have never really, I've had a few that have come that have said, hey, can you just weigh up these against this, including Myob and, and Zero and whatnot. Um, but the main ones that I've dealt with is coming back to Zero. So businesses have invested hundreds of thousands of dollars in a, in a um, fully built ERP system. Uh, this was a number of years ago, but it was, I think, about three years after they finally finished it um we're already looking back to come back to zero just because the software had basically um how quickly everything's moving in within the technology space um, the software that they had built had already been made redundant and they were making the choice of having to invest a lot to upgrade to the cloud-based system of that erp system or go to zero so they they chose the path of zero because it was about 60 entities um and it was going to be very difficult to spin up the new system online, whereas they could just set up a 60 entity, 60 file, zero files quite rapidly and get moving pretty quickly. Yeah, I, I mean, that that whole space around moving back from an ERP to zero is seems to be happening more and more, uh, at least. And I think that's probably speaking to the power of the ecosystem, but the zero hasn't stopped developing because the ecosystem keeps coming up with new solutions to these problems. So if what you know something that we discussed in the session yesterday is if you looked two years ago or three years ago and there wasn't a solution to that problem 
there might be now. Uh, and so, you know, if if you went to an ERP and it hasn't really worked out as well as you thought, well, the ecosystem's probably come a long way since you made that initial decision. So reconsidering is 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 definitely worth doing. I mean, Michael, coming to you, just to kind of wrap up this, uh, the key questions here, I do have some Q&A stuff that, that maybe I'll throw to separately um, and we can get into as a group. But I mean, from your perspective, what do you see with the, do you have any specific clients that have made zero work or, or, or any specific lines in the sand that you would be thinking, look, maybe here is where you'd be going beyond? Like, it really depends on, on, on the entity itself and what they do. I've seen businesses that have moved to things like Business Central, um, uh, like they've moved from, you know, a smaller MYOB to MYOB Advanced and then from MYOB Advanced to Business Central. Um, and, and the reason they do that is um, the ability to, uh, you know, get um, uh, direct feeds from customers in terms of, you know, we're talking um, wholesale retail, so direct shipping, um, again, William hit it straight on the head in terms of access to zero um, control is a, is a massive issue. And when you've got potentially 70 plus employees that have some form of access to your system, um, you know, you've either got to limit them within a, uh, within a um, add-on tool, a workflow tool, whether it's the, the likes of, you know, um, an inventory management solution, Unleashed or Deer or whatever, um, or you have to do it within, um, uh, or you have to do it by going to an ERP. Uh, a lot of the time clients tell us, well, we don't, we, we need people to have access to various bits of information and logging into so many systems is, is a limiting factor for them um, because there's a, a technology issue and understanding issue. So they prefer access to one system, one look, one feel. And that's often why that's often, that's one of the answers of, of why people move. Um, the line in the sand is it, it, it changes. It does case by case. Um, so it's, it's just talk to your professional, get some good advice. Um, Take a long, hard think before you take the jump. Yeah, no, I, I mean, and that seems consistent throughout all the conversations we're having, which is it's not just if you're across border. It's not just if you start to deal in transfer pricing. It's not just if you've got this complicated, you know, accounting situation. That means ERP. It's this culmination of evidence, situation, plans for the future that that tend to be required to, to figure that out so yes thanks michael and and thanks thanks michael william and david for everything you've added so far i i have some um questions so if uh, i might flip the last two points on the agenda here and just go q a first then we can share our takeaways and, and wrap up so do do any of you have a good solution when it comes to the limit of tracking categories in zero so someone said what do you you know what do you do there so zero can do two but if I want to track to a, a further degree, uh, what are you suggesting? Uh, I'll jump in. That's okay. Um, so basically, um, uh, so the limit is two, and you can play around with that. So if if you know you've um, you can use your chart of account, which you know extends things a wee bit, um, and then. Uh, you know, you might use a geocon or something to pull out reports into into Google Sheets, so you can you can do your reporting in Google Sheets around specifics around tracking categories. So, a lot of people use say a tracking category category for regions and, and a tracking category for um, a specific expense type like um, motor vehicles or or registrations or you know if if you're using it's a bit cheap and nasty, but if you're using a tracking category for, um, uh, you can almost use a tracking category for two things um, and then pull it together in Excel. Um, but it's, it, you've got to be, you've got to have a really good plan at the start of how you do it. Um, so probably three types of tracking is, is how far you'd go in terms of two tracking categories and chart of accounts, anything more um, you can, play around but it gets into the slightly messy scenario from there i don't know if that helped um or not that's all right all good all good appreciate that michael i um uh, i might throw 
to William or David, if you've got experience here, on uh, what ERPs do the panel typically see being implemented after businesses have outgrown zero? Most commonly see NetSuite. Um, that you know that seems to be the sort of default incumbent assumption that uh, that people have. Um, you know, a little bit of Business Central, but but yeah, mainly 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 NetSuite. Cool. Easy. Will, anything to add there? Yeah, yeah. mine's been, uh, the, the ones that I've seen is uh, NetSuite, Mild Advanced and Workday. And I mean, they're all much for muchness. They all do the same things, a one-stop shop for everything. So yeah, I guess it's really how good the sales team on their side is. Nice. Uh, we've actually got two questions here. So Michael, William, I might throw to you on uh, two of the same question for your perspective. On, are there any specific tools or add-ons that you would recommend to manage intercompany charges? Uh, we use Spotlight for consolidation, but still manage the intercompany balances in Excel. Another person asked the same thing. What's a good solution for recording managing intercompany loans? Um, do you mind if I go yeah, first, Will? Uh, yeah, you go first. There you go. Go for it. Go for it, mate. Uh, well, yeah, I do actually have to apologize to David and Jack because we were asked about what our multi-entity um apps were earlier in the day and neither Michael or I said Mayday. So um, that is where this has all come from. So for both of those answers, Mayday basically resolves that. So I've got a couple of clients. One is uh, eight entities um, were prior to, when was it David? About December, December 23, we first reached yeah. out, I think. Um, prior to that, we're doing for about 12 months, uh, Excel-based intercompany loans, Excel-based transactions, to make sure we were tracking and posting each side. And then uh, December, uh, we so I saw Mayday on, online, um, some posts about them. And December 31, we implemented it and basically a day's work was brought down to sort of 10, 15 minutes. Uh, Mayday, I would yeah, definitely can't, can't thank them enough. I know David knows that I've been on many calls with him, thanking him <laughs> for the amount of time he saved. But yeah, Mayday, it's got, three parts to it. Uh, there's the um, recharger, which is you can say, hey, this entity paid 10 grand for accounting fees. Can I please recharge five grand to this entity? Um, there is the just loan matrix, which is a free service, if I recall correctly, um, which you can just plug all your entities in and then link up your loans and that'll tell you where the, um, or how much the variances was and when it arose, so you can click into the zero transactions and it'll say we had 10 grand on this side, but not 10 grand on that side. So quite easy to identify. And then the final one, which I do enjoy the most, in, it's called BRAG. Don't ask me what it stands for, but maybe Jack and David can jump in after this. But it uh, is basically if entity one pays a bill on behalf of entity two for a variety of reasons. I mean, the main one that I have right now is uh, entity one has all the bank accounts, entity two doesn't, but we obviously are billing entity two for certain things. Um, so brag, you basically you load the bill into entity two and then in the bank reconciliation of zero of your first entity, you can click on if there's a little uh, add on that your bank rec gets and it says Mayday. Um, and you click on that and then you can see all the bills that are outstanding of your other entity and reconcile directly there against the loan. So, yeah, for both those questions, um, I would reach out to Jack or David, depending on where you are, and, and look at Mayday because it's been an absolute lifesaver for our multi-entities. I appreciate that, William. Yep, um, we didn't mention Mayday. Mayday is, um, is good. It saved me so much time in the whole spreadsheet, spreadsheet, uh, you know, thing. So side by side spreadsheets. Um, so long as you've got a good opening balance and you've reconciled things, um, or you've asked the Mayday team to give you a give you a starting point, um, you, you can use it. Uh, you know, I've got a group recently, eight entities. No one's ever been able to fully reconcile them. We're now reconciling them month on month, which is great. Um, loan accounts, posting interest, great stuff. The only other way around in terms of one of the questions was, um, uh, you know, inter-entity recharges, you know, receiving a bill in one entity and then splitting it out. Um, potentially in zero, you can you can use the, the customer functionality and actually allocate it to a customer. And at the end of the, end of the month, bill, um, you bill it out. 
and use the, the zero link between zero files to build it and approve it and appears in, a, um, in another, uh, another file as, as a draft. And, and that helps capture things. That's what we've done in the past. Um, you know, so we're not doing things just through loan accounts. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the main thing. There, there are other tools. There, there, you know, there are other tools out there, but um, you know, this is one that has worked um, the best uh, from what I see. Um, yeah. And that's, that's why. Awesome. Thanks guys. Uh, and I, and I think it speaks to, you know, the question that's questions coming up, speak a little bit to that new, new area that, that David kind of spoke a bit about around intercompany separate to consolidation uh, in that way. We've got these intercompany challenges during and throughout the month that we need to keep on top of, not just, at the end of the month, once we've got everything it's sorted, we need to consolidate those intercompany balances. So uh, I'll take this as an opportunity to wrap up. And, and so if I could just get from each of you kind of a takeaway, I mean, from my end, something that I loved hearing or that was very, I kind of hit the nail on the head was that, that the, the, the decision around ERP or zero isn't just a decision around cost and time and wanting to avoid the pain. It can be a decision around the optimum solution, better automation, ease of use, uh, it can actually be a better outcome, not just a, let's see if we can last a little bit longer on zero, stretch it out another year or two and deal with the pain. It might actually be a better outcome for you than what you think you might get by moving to an ERP. I mean, David, what was your takeaway from today? Yeah. So I will go back to the, like, be really specific about, what is the reason you think you are outgrowing zero? Look within at zero, then look out to the ecosystem. And then if at the end of that, you're saying specifically, this is a problem, this is a need that's really important that can't be addressed by zero plus its ecosystem, then, and only then, is it an indicator that ERP might be the right move for you? Because I've just seen too many of the stories where people slip into the kind of track to be the received wisdom of people, businesses like us use ERPs. And, you know, literally that there's one business that instantly springs to mind, you know, their, their neat suite implementation, just the consulting fee side of it is now over a million pounds when you include external consultant fees and internal development resource. And the financial controller there who sort of came in after the decision had been taken is sort of pulling his hair out saying, we could have just stuck with, um, could have just stuck with zero. Michael, last takeaway, top tip. You guys, everyone keeps still on the thunder here. It's it's the same thing, you know, every, everyone has their own endpoint between zero and, and ERPs. Um, it's no longer a zero is just an accounting system for single entities. Um, it is a um, plethora of, of connected um, apps and solutions that allow businesses to work the most efficiently. Um, and, and there are reasons to move to an ERP, but you know, as David has said, and Will as, as well, um, you've got the choice now um, there are reasons to move, control being a really big one, to be honest, especially for those entities that deal with, with audits. Um, but there are ways around it um, in some instances. And just approach someone for advice. Don't just believe the hype and, and you know, great sales because um, that's often what happens. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Uh, William, to finish it up. Yeah, uh, I wasn't spoken about too much, but I think it's really, really important is all of this tech changes and everything like that. It's basically pointless if you don't have an exceptional team that's sort of open to change and, and buy-in for it. So I've seen some absolutely horrible paper base. It's, I wouldn't even call it a tech stack that works amazingly and super, super quick, four-day month then close. And I've also seen some perfect tech stacks that are, don't work at all because the team don't use it. So making sure as sort of financial professionals, I think the role has changed a lot that a core skill for everyone is to have ch change management. If you want to transition to sort of leadership roles, you really need to be able to work through with the team and sort of show the, the benefits and why we are making this change and how it will help their role to sort of in, in, further their career um, and not just say, this is what is happening and, and why, because 
nine times out of 10, they probably won't use it. And then there's, it's, you're basically back to square one. Great. Good spot to wrap it up. Uh, thanks everyone who hung in there. I know we've gone a little bit over time, so I appreciate that. And if you had to jump early and you're watching the recording, that's cool too. Just very quickly, what's coming up next? So tomorrow we have streamlining spend management with Will. Then we have automating AP operations with Lightyear and executing complex HR and payroll with Employment Hero. So some really great topics coming up, all, all addressing hopefully the, the same audience. So if you are here today, hopefully they're relevant. If you haven't registered for any other sessions, jump on that website linked below, apacenterprise.cfotechstack.com. Uh, choose any sessions you want. If you can't make it, you'll get the recordings. So thank you once again for coming. Uh, Michael, William, huge, hugely valuable. Appreciate your time. Appreciate your perspective. Uh, and David, of course, too. Thank you for coming. Thanks very much. Thanks, all. Bye. See ya. Thanks Bye. for coming, guys. Have a great day. Bye.